Thank you so much for the warm welcome here to our session this morning. As Michael mentioned already, this topic of our talk is stop pivoting, start innovating. Those of you who are engineers may know this already. Pivoting is not a major shift. What pivoting really means is a turn around a fixed position. That's all that pivoting is. You had a fixed position and you're turning around a little bit. That's all it is. Now, innovating is so much more. If we were just pivoting, we would only make a small shift. And a small shift has never been enough to move us forward. And that's true today even more than it has ever been before. So my call to you is stop pivoting, stop the small changes, stop the small adjustments that you're making, but do something really different. Shift to a different place, not somewhere else, and do something very different. The idea that is behind it is very similar to what Henry Ford said quite a while ago. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have told me they want faster horses. That's the small shift. That's the small change that we do based on where we are at the moment, how we see the world at the moment, and what we think of the world today. And you see that this does not lead to real innovation. That's not the big shift, right? That doesn't create much new. That doesn't get us to what we really need. Because the reality is this. The marketplace today is more competitive than it has ever been. There are such strong forces pulling us in so many different directions. And the marketplace, both in the job market, but also in the, in the business market, is fiercely brutal and competitive. And we need to stay on top of this. So what I want to share with you today here are some tools that you can learn from companies that make these big shifts, from these companies that really are able to innovate and not just pivot the ones who are the masters of the big change. And we want to take a look at those and see what can we learn from this, not just on a corporate basis, but for us as individuals. What can we pull from this so that we become better at the art of innovating and not making small adjustments? What I want to leave with you after we end this session today is a bit of a toolkit, really. And the toolkit will consist of five skills that I want to share with you. And they are the five mindsets of an innovator. What are the five things that can set us apart, that make us really different as an innovator, and that let us step up and change the game and help our organizations? Now, let's start with number one, the first mindset of an innovator. And for that, I want to go back in history a little bit. I want to share something that has really shaped our thinking quite some time ago. And in reality, it hasn't fully seeped in yet. For centuries, people thought that our destiny was in the hand of external forces. Now, it could be that you called this nature. It could be a greater power, or you might call it God. And for a long time, we thought we don't have control over our destiny. Reality is. Many of you may still feel that, right? When you try to decide which lane on the highway is moving the fastest and you always get it wrong, or when you pick which checkout light at the supermarket you perceive is moving fastest, and you're still wrong again. Well, I'm talking on a much more global scale here, that in the grand scheme of things, people believe that they had no control over their destiny. But if we believe that, then we don't really create anything because it's all done for us. There is no room for human creativity then and no innovation. And most importantly, we didn't know what these powers had in store for us. And that was the belief that people held for thousands of years. And the question of what comes next was also not a question that we could ask Google or Siri or Alexa. We really did not know. And this was changed with one person who stumbled across something that was really a fascinating observation. The explorer I'm talking about lived in Pisa, Italy. Anyone know who I'm talking about? It was Galileo. Galileo! <laughs> he made his discovery in the Cathedral of Pisa one Easter morning 
when all the bells were chiming, he watched the chandelier in the cathedral. And the chandelier was really something like this pendulum that you can see here. And he saw the pendulum swing back and forth. Now, had this been the Leaning Tower of Pisa, this might not have been a big deal, but there was no Leaning Cathedral of Pisa. The cathedral actually sat on perfect angles on the ground. No drunk architect there, just the way you'd expect the cathedral to look. So, Galileo was looking at this chandelier. And when the bells stopped chiming, the chandelier slowly stopped swinging, like you would expect from this pendulum here. Here is what is important. As the swings got smaller, he noticed one swing still takes the same amount of time. Let me just slow this down a bit. Takes the same amount of time as before. And the time the chandelier takes for one swing does not change with the size of the swing. Now, that is counterintuitive, isn't it? We think the wider the swing, the longer it should take. Tiger Woods would certainly think so, and maybe it is in golf, but in this case, it really isn't the case. And the consequence on this is that we have something here for accurate timekeeping. It was this discovery that led not only to us having clocks, but it also got us to the moon ultimately. And this is at the core of much of modern technology. So, those of you who find yourself sometimes just staring at lights or a chandelier or the ceiling for hours, you may actually not just be wasting your time, you may be on the brink of brilliance. But much more important is the impact Galileo's discovery had on our thinking. It was a breakthrough that we discovered in the laws of physics. We were able to make a prediction. It's not random greater forces that shape the future. No, we can tell the future in this little simple thing, but the concept is there. We can predict the future in, with much more accuracy than we can predict the future in the fortune cookie. Because we can predict something, we can use this to our advantage. And therefore, we can actually now shape the future. Now, with Galileo's pendulum observation about 500 years ago, a breakthrough in thinking happened. Our role shifted from being at the whim of greater powers to actually being in control. That was incredibly powerful and it has changed the way we see ourselves in the world. So many advances in society and in culture are based on this paradigm shift. But then something changed again about our understanding of the world. And we're going to talk, we're going to transition from now talking about a paradigm shift to maybe something that would be better called a pendulum shift. But a hundred years ago, another scientist discovered something about the pendulum that Galileo completely overlooked. Galileo just didn't see it. The name of that scientist was Poincar. Poincar was very famous again, French mathematician, Probably not famous enough to make it in the Bohemian Rhapsody, but nonetheless, very well-known mathematician. And he noticed there is one point in the motion of this pendulum that Galileo overlooked. And that point in the motion is different from all the others. The point I'm talking about here, and Galileo couldn't see it because it was a chandelier, but in the pendulum, I can show you where it is. That point that is completely different is when the pendulum stands at the top. At this point, when it's really straight up, it behaves completely differently. When it's right in the middle, we cannot predict whether it goes left or right. It's really like the Supreme Court today, where we also can't say whether it goes right or left, right? Now, even though this pendulum is otherwise a symbol of predictability, when it stands up here and it's right at the top, that's where it becomes unpredictable. Now, this could make it the newest game in Vegas, but it doesn't seem like such a big deal because it really takes quite a bit of effort to get it to that point. And it's only this one point here, right? So you might ask, well, what is the point? It's important. First of all, physicists call this point here because it is so special, 
a singularity. Now, when a physicist fills out a profile on match.com, as soon as he or she lists their occupation, the software immediately offers them a full refund. But in this case, a singularity actually means something different. The big deal here of the silly point is when we amplify this. And here is how this works. This pendulum here is actually not just one pendulum, but it is three connected pendula. When I take these pins out, you can see this. There are three actually here that are moving separately. Now, just that fact, if you take nothing out of this talk other than this here, the plural of pendulum is pendula. Just that in itself will win you money at many, many bar bets. But here's the really neat thing about this. When you unlock these three different pendula and when you start swinging them separately and you set this whole thing in motion, they still influence other, each other. You can see that, right? They're connected with each other. But it's not like peer pressure. They're just having a very gentle and careful influence on each other. And when I set this whole thing in motion, that's when the magic really happened. Let's take a look at this. Right, they exchange energy back and forth. Let me just give it another whack here. And what happens here is that the singularity that's at the top gets amplified again and again. And now you can see that this pendulum that looked so boring before is actually looking pretty fascinating. It's pretty cool, right? This is no CGI, there is no effect, no video effect playing out. This is real, no Photoshop or anything running in the background. What you see is really what is happening here. That is the motion of this pendulum. And the interesting thing is, I mean, you look at this, right? What comes up for you? You might think of your organizational structure or the organization after the last reorg, or you may think this is a Ferris wheel that just hasn't been inspected properly. Maybe that's something that goes through your mind. But the key is that this pendulum is no longer predictable. It's really like your 80-year-old Uncle John at the Thanksgiving dinner, no longer predictable. And in fact, no computer can predict the motion of this pendulum, no matter how sophisticated it is. The sales clerk at Best Buy might try and tell you something different, but they're actually lying. It really is impossible to predict the motion of this pendulum. And because of that, this pendulum is called a chaotic pendulum. Great name, don't you think? It sounds almost like a good name for a heavy metal band. It was Poincaré who discovered the unusual point at the top of this pendulum. And years later, he would write in his diary that this discovery still doesn't let him sleep well. Pretty sad, right? And the chaotic pendulum was discovered almost 100 years before Ambien was discovered, so poor Poincaré really couldn't sleep any better. So he stayed awake at night, stressed out because he had discovered where chaos enters the world, and there is really no predictability left. That's the key piece. We think this pendulum is predictable, and it isn't. It is chaotic, and it is the place where chaos enter the world, enters the world. And that's important because we live our lives with the idea that we can predict what's next. That's the assumption that we always make in our world. We think we know the laws, we know some rules, and they play out, and that's why we can predict what's next. But the reality is, that's just not true. We make plans based on what we think is predictable and we follow 10 steps of something because we expect that after step seven, there will be a step eight. And we do so many things with the idea that we live towards a known future. And this pendulum shows us that this is not so. We can't predict anything. In fact, it's a waste of time to try and predict the future. Our time is much better spent on thinking what we can do right now to move something in the right direction, in the direction in which we want to go. And that is the key to innovation as well, to not try and react to something because we think based on what we notice, we can make a prediction and handle the future that way. But instead of that, create the future 
based on our real ability to create something new. And that really is the first mindset of the innovator. Creating beats reacting anytime. When you have a chance to come up with something new, to really create something afresh, it is always the better place to be. Instead of asking yourself, what do I notice? What do I do based on what I notice and react based on that? That's the stronger way to do. Now I know sometimes we have to react, but try and find that moment of creation where you can do something new instead of having to react to something. Let's take a look at the second mindset and see where that takes us. The second one, I would like to kick off with a little game. And we're going to play this game all together. Now I call this game, what is this contraption? I would like to get your fingers onto the chat now. I'm gonna ask you to contribute something in the chat in a moment. And here is how this works. I'm going to show you a device from the past. Many of us are technologists, work in tech organizations, so it's always going to be a techy type device. And I'm going to ask you to guess what this might be. Okay, I'm going to say a few words about the device, I'll show you the image of it, but most importantly, I want you to type in chat what this might be. I'll pay attention to the chat. I hope to be able to spot the first one who says it, but we've got so many folks, so the chat might be super fast. As soon as I see it flash up, I'll comment on it and I'll try and shout out the name if I see it and I'm able to recognize it. So, device number one looks like this. It is from the year 1882. What might this be? Wow, guys, you are good. Computer, computer, calculator, weaving loom, we've got that computer, Polarith punch, computer, steam engine, ENIAC, very cool. Folks, the first answer was the right one already. It is actually the first computer. It was called at that time the difference engine and invented by Charles Babbage, used to tabulate polynomial functions. Very cool. Many of you got that right. Very, very nice. Let's take a look at the second device. What might this be here? Telephone. It's not a telephone. It's not a typewriter. It's not a telegraph. See where this guy has his foot. Do you see what he's doing with his foot? Phonograph, stethoscope. Yeah, now we're going in a good direction. You're in a medical direction. And I see the right answer here. John had it. I let the others guess for a moment. It is a medical device. You're so right. And here, Jacqueline has it as well. It is the first EKG. It's from the year 1900. And the guy has his foot in the water because he needs a neutral terminal to connect his body. But the more important lead is the one that's hard to see. It goes to his heart. Let's take a look at the next device. This is from 1915. Curious to see who gets that right. It's a device from 1915. It's not a telegraph. Tape recorder, I see that going in a good direction. We're almost there. Oh, we've got it. Ron has it. I think Ron might have been the first one. It is a wire recorder. The first recording devices were wire recorders and they used a wire. They magnetized the wire and recorded the sound instead of a tape on a wire. They're still used today, actually. Does anyone know where wire recorders are used today? There's still one application where wire recorders are used. In the army, Kinder, you might be right, I'm not sure, not in courtrooms, they are the black box recorders because the wire is much more robust than a tape would be. And black box in planes, you've got it, Jeff, absolutely right. The wire is just much more robust and can record something and, and withstand the crash. Let's take a look at the next device. Might remind us of our current times a little bit, even though it is from 19... 19. Device from 1919. What do you think the purpose of this device might have been? CPAP. I don't know what CPAP means. Help me with that. A breathing machine, air filter, ventilator. Very good. So it is a ventilator. You're absolutely right. Oxygen machine. Yeah, almost. Tell me why it was used. Write something in chat why you think this machine was used. For TB. Lie detector? No, it was not for TB. It's not an iron lung. 1919. 
For the Spanish flu, Jeff got it right. Absolutely. This was the breathing apparatus that was developed during the Spanish flu to help um, the pandemic at that time. Aren't we glad that we don't have to use these kind of devices for our breathing at the moment? One more here. This is from 1963. We're making a fast step ahead now. Binoculars, Viscope, VR headset. It is essentially the first VR headset. You're absolutely right. Television goggles, they were called at the time. They are not stereoscopes, so they have two screens, but not like in stereoscopes where you have slightly different images and your brain calculates the 3D image. They actually have the same image there. You can maybe make out the antennas there, but these were television goggles. And here's something from the 70s, 1970s. What do you think you have there? A stenograph, typewriter, cool typewriter, electric typewriter, gaming chair. Oh, I love the gaming chair idea. It is not typewriter. It was a ergonomic workstation, a workstation for ergonomic purposes. That was the idea here. And when I saw this, I thought you might be struggling with whatever you have to go back to after the pandemic, or you may have gone back to already but I can almost be sure it doesn't look as horrible as what you see here because spending the whole day here does not look overly pleasant, especially when you notice the antenna that she has coming out from her helmet there. I wonder if this is some kind of um, dictating device that is connected right to the head here. Okay, now I shared with you some devices from the past, some machinery, some tools that we used in the past. And the reason I did this, is that we have a tendency to do something with the past. And it is that tendency that is very often in the way of innovation. Very often we stick to that past. We hold on to it, we hold firm to it. Now we don't hold firm to these devices, I get that. But once we have an idea, once we found something, once we discovered it, we fall in love with that idea. We like these ideas, the discoveries that we make, and we get attached to them. And that's not helpful. Let me show you a different answer to getting attached to things that are outdated or maybe not getting attached. Here is something that you find at Ben & Jerry's, the ice cream manufacturer's headquarter. Let me show a video to you of that headquarter. Flavor Graveyard. Apparently they uh, ended Dave Matthew band uh, Magic Brownies. Maybe that had something to do with the fact that they uh, they dumped their sewage from their RV on a boat of people. Look at this one. It has several death dates. It's like chocolate almond fudge chip. It's like a zombie that keeps rising from its grave. Chocolate chip cookie dough frozen yogurt. Apparently the frozen yogurt wasn't as popular. That's my jam. White Russian economic crunch. It's not a very appetizing. It says uh, to remember this. Let me stop this here. And you may have recognized this already. You may have seen it. In fact, it is the ice cream flavor graveyard that exists at the Ben and Jerry headquarter. What they do is when they retire an ice cream flavor, they have a funeral. They really have a funeral for that ice cream flavor, and it is their way of saying goodbye to that flavor. What a cool thing, right? What a fascinating thing to do. And the reason they do it is so that there is a, there is a, um, a, a liturgy, there is a process of saying goodbye to something and to celebrating it and bringing it to an end. And the takeaway that I want to share with you here, the important part, a ritual, thank you so much. The important part here is that we need to have this at our places of work and maybe in our personal lives as well. The, the business funeral, if you want, a way for us to say goodbye to something. And this is something that innovators are able to perfect, a way to let go of something, to be able to say something is over, be done with it, end it, and really close it off. 
and be able to say something is over and we move past it and we move on from something. So hard to do because we like our ideas, especially when they are important to us and it's tough for us to let go. But this is the second part, let go of the past. And not in a way of dishonoring it, but to recognize that you have to move away to find something new. Now, let's take a look at the third mindset. What else is needed for the innovator? I would like to start this off with a little bit of a game as well. And this game I call, Would You Rather? And I want to use this opportunity to get to know some of you a little bit better. So we're gonna play a game now where you will need your um, smartphones. So I could ask you to pull out your phones real quick. The game I want to play with you. So it is, would you rather, and I'm gonna have a conversation with a couple of you, but we are 500 people in the room, so I can't talk to all of you. And I want to pick up maybe one, two or three people to have a really short conversation with so that I can talk to a couple of you. And the way I would like us to do this is with a bit of a competition, we are going to play the game, would you rather, and I embed this into a bit of a race, into a game that's gonna be fairly fast. And the game is, I'll call this an emoji race. Let me just see if I can stop this here. No. Bummer. I'm not going to be able to start this. So here's what we do this. I'm going to do this a bit differently with you. Instead of inviting one or two of you to, um, to actually turn the microphone on, I'm going to play it with all of you. Maybe that's the, the nicer way to do it anyway, because this way I have a chance to hear from all of you what your reactions are to these different questions. So it's a would you rather question. I'm gonna take a look at the chat and I'm gonna see where sort of the majority opinion falls on these things. And they're all questions related to innovation and is intended to make you think a little bit about where you would find your sweet spot in your thinking, in your world and in approaching different aspects of innovation. First question for you is this, would you rather live in the 22nd or the 18th century? Just type it in chat for me, please, and I'll see if we get a majority opinion here. I know this is not gonna be highly statistical, but I see a large majority for the 22nd century. I see the 18th century popping up occasionally. Most of you are with the 22nd century. Interesting to hear, right? Not sure if it's a statement about innovation, where we feel more innovation is the 18th century hasn't been all that bad. And we don't know, of course, what in the 22nd one is, but it's certainly the one that would bring more curiosity out of everyone. Next question for you is this. Would you rather have a fast forward or rewind button in your life? Fast forward or rewind? Oh, come many rewind button coming in. I think the rewinds have it at the moment. Pause is not an option, Jeff. <laughs> nice question. <laughs> Maybe you have to toggle fast between the rewind and the fast forward. Okay. And he says neither, both. Okay. I love it. So, right. So, this is maybe the other um, takeaway here for the innovators. You've got to break the rules, right? Just don't answer the questions. Go for something different. We've got another pause button here. Pause. I like that, <laughs> Judy. Okay. Thank you very much. Next one. Would you rather be able to read minds or predict the future? Predict the future or read minds? Read minds seems to be the stronger one at the moment. Wouldn't that be fascinating, right? Tapping into what other people are thinking, predicting the future. And realistically, reading minds is technologically probably doable at some point. Predicting the future, I don't think will be with what I said about the pendulum before. Very good. Okay. I, would, I think the reading the minds had it. Let me give you one more here. Would you rather go into space or the deepest depths of the seas? What would your preferred area of explor exploration be? Okay, we are almost at 100% space at the moment, right? A couple of you have C here. Okay, a couple of you have C here, but the vast majority is on space. Okay, cool. Now, here is why I've asked you this question. Let me share a story with you about something that happened 
at an airport. At a US airport, they did customer survey studies to figure out how satisfied the passengers were with their experience at the airport. And the rating they got from the passengers on a scale from one to five was about a 2.2, 2.3. If you've ever done any customer service studies or any, any kind of rankings like that, you know that 2.2, 2.3 is a miserable rating. That's absolutely awful on a scale from one to five, right? It's horrible. So the airport recognized this, of course, and they asked themselves immediately, well, what do we have to do to improve it? And they asked the passengers like any business would do. They wanted to hear from the passengers, from their customers, what do we have to do? And the passengers answered the question. They gave a consistent answer. And the answer the passenger gave was, it takes too long for the bags to make their way from the plane to the carousel. And then the airport did something that again, any business would do. They heard the complaint, they heard what's wrong, and they set out to fix it. So the problem is bags take too long from the plane to the carousel. What they did was they looked at their conveyor system. They put tracers into the bags. They monitored the, the flow of the bags with video and these tracers to figure out where are delays in the system, where do bags go in loops maybe. And they, based on what they found, they redesigned the conveyor system, the hardware, and also the control software. Overall, this was a solid eight-figure project where they dumped a lot of money in because they recognized something's got to be done about this to elevate the satisfaction of the passengers. And they were pretty successful from an engineering perspective. In fact, they were super successful. What they accomplished was to get the average time it took a bag from the plane to the conveyor down from 35 minutes to just over 15. Time saving of over 50%. They were thrilled. They were super proud because they felt we've addressed what the passengers asked us to do. We fixed the problem. Now let's check how satisfied our passengers are. Give me a guess in the chat again, what rating they got from the passengers after that eight figure upgrade. Before they got about 2.2, 2.3 on a five point scale, what do you think they got afterwards? So some of you say three, I have a hard time tracking this. You are super fast. Thank you so much for the engagement. Same, I can see that. I saw a couple of you even going down. Right? <laughs> That's of course a horrible outcome if that was the case. Lower, here we've got Amy again. Thank you so much, Amy, lower. Some of you are more optimistic. I've got a couple of fives here. Anita, thank you for the five. Very cool. They didn't get up to a five. They got just a marginal improvement of about, they got it up to about 2.5, 2.6 really, really poor improvement. And of course they asked themselves, well, why in the world? We've done what the passengers asked us to do and we are not getting the rating up. And here is why. They asked the wrong question. They hired a consultant to figure out what a better question would be or how to solve that. And they realized the question they had been asking was this one here. This is what they did get and the question they were trying to solve. The question they got was, how do we reduce the time it takes the baggage to get from the plane to the carousel? That was sort of the challenge question, the one they wanted to address. And it's what the passengers told them, right? Don't blame them. The passengers really, really told them that. And it's the wrong question to address. The question they should have addressed is this. How do we reduce the wait time of the passengers at the carousel? It's a nuance. It's just a little bit different. But it opens the door to something completely different. Instead of reducing the time it takes the bags to make their way to the carousel, if they reduce the wait time of the passengers at the carousel, here is what they can do. They can do a couple of things. Well, I can do several things. But they can slow down the passengers now. And that's an option that wasn't clear to them with the question before. What they did was two things. Number one, they changed the walkway that the passengers took from the gate to the carousel. They made it artificially long. So they rerouted the passengers through the terminal in an extra long way so that it would take longer. 
And the second thing they did was they asked the controllers to park the planes at a gate furthest away from the terminal building. Before they had the controllers direct the planes close to the terminal so that the passengers wouldn't have to walk. And now they changed that and parked the planes as far out on the terminal as they could so that the walkway became longer. And the result of that was that on average, it took the passengers longer to make their way to the carousel than the bags. Which means on average, not for all cases, but on average for the majority of cases, people arrived at the carousel and the bags were already there. And that's when people got happy. That's when the ratings went up. That's when satisfaction set in. And now, of course, with that positive reinforcement that they got there, they thought, well, what else can we do? And they looked at that question again and realized, well, there's more we can do. We can take this a step further. And we can ask ourselves, well, what if we change the question one more time and focus on the experience? How do we improve the passenger experience as they walk to the carousel? And that's where they come up, and many of you wrote it already, with shopping along that walkway. So they put up some stores, but they also put up coffee shops, knowing that no one or hardly anyone would buy coffee when they arrive, but the majority of people like the smell of coffee. And they also put up corporate art so that it looks beautiful, it looks impressive, it looks just magnificent. When you walk to the carousel, it was an elevating experience for all senses to get from the plane to the carousel. And that's when their satisfaction rating went through the roof. And it came from changing the question. Ask yourself different questions. That is the key to this. You need to shift the question in order to step out of your current thinking. And that's a tool, that's a key that innovators have mastered. And it's the third mindset of the innovator is to ask different questions. Stick not to the same questions, but ask yourself different ones and ask other people, what would you do with that situation? How would you handle this? What questions come up for you in that situation so that you expand your thinking on the questions? Now, I saw several of you were guessing the name of the airport already. Let me put this out here. I didn't mention the name of the airport to open the door for this question now. Which airport do you think this might have been? I didn't mention the name. Put a guess in here. Oh, Carol writes Austin. <laughs> it is Austin. Wow, Carol, that was impressive. Um, it really is Austin Airport. So next time you go there, pay attention to it and see what they do to you. They've um, stepped it down a little bit from what they did initially. I mentioned to you the park the gates far out. What they didn't realize, an unintended consequence of that was that the departing passengers then started complaining because the departing passengers kept wondering, well, why in the world do we have to walk past all these empty gates to get to the plane that's parked at the far end? And um, that's why they had to tone that down a little bit. But nonetheless, pay attention to it. They're still practicing this here. Let's take a look at the fourth mindset, number four of how to step into more innovation. And we're going to start this off with another game. The game that we're going to play now, I call this real or fake. I am going to share with you possible book titles in a moment. I'm going to give you possible book titles and all I want you to do is enter into the chat if you think this is a real book title or a fake one. Did I make it up or is it real? Okay, I see the comments here that you've lost video. Let me see. Okay, got it. I can't control the screen for you. So if you can go into speaker view. Okay, some of, if it's working for some, that tells me it's probably not at my end. Okay, thanks so much. Now, real or fake? Let's play real or fake. Fingers on the keyboard, please, and type in if you think this is a real book title or a fake one. First book title is this. The man who mistook his wife for a hat. 
Wow, vast majority for a real book title. A couple of fakes are flashing by here, but super fast and the real. <laughs> it is a, a vast majority for real here. I would love to tap into your thinking here, right? So how is that? Do you know the book or are you fast on Amazon at the moment? Or do you think he's going to ask for a real book title to start us off? I'd love to tap into that. Um, but nonetheless, catchy title that sells. Yeah, you're probably right. It is a real book title. It really exists. The man who mistook his wife for a hat. Um, read the book. Lynette says she read the book. He <laughs> got it. Very cool. Next one. Real or fake? Do androids dream of electric sheep? Okay. I think there are more fakes coming in now. Many fakes coming in now. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's 50-50. Folks, it is a real book. It does exist. It's actually the story behind Blade Runner. And that is what was used to create the movie Blade Runner. Let's go to the next one. Real estate riches in 28 days. Real estate riches in 28 days. Okay, my sense is the real count is going up again. Fewer fakes than we had for the Androids. Okay, let me give you the resolution to this one. It is actually fake. I got inspired by this when I saw the book title, Real Estate Riches in 14 Days. <laughs> exactly. Nancy, you got it right. It's not, the, it's not 30 days, it's not 28 days, it's 14 days. And when I saw this, I thought immediately, right, 28 days is just simply too long to get rich. It's got to happen in 14 days, otherwise it's just not real. Um, next one. The sex lives of cannibals. What do we think of this one? The sex lives of cannibals. I'm getting complaints about the book titles. Oh my God, <laughs> we're going for the third option. Looks to me like we're at almost 50-50. Dangerous, true and hilarious. <laughs> Would rather not think about it. Yep, I get you. It does indeed exist again. It is a real book title. Hungry to the point of tired. Probably someone's dissertation there could very well be hungry to the point of tired. Where are we on this one? Many fakes coming in. This looks like a fake majority of the Okay, let me just take a look at this one. It is fake. This does not exist. Next one. Pole dancing to gospel hymns. Pole dancing to gospel hymns. What do we think about this one? Why not? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> you hope the world is a better place. Please, please don't let it be true, right? Fake, real. Okay, folks, this book is a real one and it is in fact so successful. It is in its second edition. The title that you see up here is actually the cover of the first edition. When you look it up on Amazon, you'll see it with the second edition. It is has nothing to do with the title. Let me say this as well. It's an anthology of poetry and one of the poems starts with that line. Okay, now. The reason we're going there is that one thing that's for us always important when we innovate is to look at different options. We've got to find different solutions. And that means also looking at some of the impossible solutions, at some of the things that we think this cannot be, this cannot be true. And we've got to take it down that path. We've got to walk down that path of, I don't think this is going to work. At least we need to bear with this for a moment. Because if we can't take this path, we are not going to be really innovative. Innovations, when you look at them, they always take that path from impossible over improbable to inevitable. And the only way to get there is to allow yourself to work with things that you don't believe have much of a chance. We've got to take a gamble on that. We've got to try this out. And that means we have got to try different solutions. We've got to try out different things that we may not have thought work out. So innovator mindset number four, look for new solutions, especially those that you don't immediately think might work right now.
Let's take a look at number five, innovators mindset number five. And for that, I would like to, you to introduce you to a hero of mine. Her name is Ashley Sullivan. Ashley Sullivan was a contestant on American Idol. And she was on the show about 10 years ago now, and her audition still sticks with me. And that's why I want to share her audition video with you. Anyone remember Ashley Sullivan by any chance? Give me a yes or no real quick in the chat. I'm gonna pay attention to that. Curious to see if, oh, there are a couple of, one of you said yes here, very cool. I couldn't see your name, but nonetheless, it looks like, can't see the video, still can't see others, see it, okay. Who, Ashley Sullivan, Ashley Sullivan. So, let me share with you the audition video of Ashley Sullivan. Ashley, come on in. Hi. Hi, I was gonna be cool, calm, and that just went out the window. Hi. Hey, Sorry. what's your name? My, name? my name's Ashley. Tell us something about yourself. I just want to perform. I just want to be in front of America. I want to be in front of you guys. I want everyone to have to hear me sing, at least for three minutes, maybe further. But I'm, just, I'm so beside myself right now. So I, I ramble when I'm nervous. It's really unsoffered. Okay. Okay. Deep breath. Okay, let's take a deep breath. Do your thing. Yeah. What song? Uh, Gimme Gimme from Early Modern Mill. Here I am, St. Valentine. My bags are packed. I'm next in line. And Aphrodite, don't forget me. Romeo and Juliet, me. Fly dove and sing sparrow. Give me that voice, famous arrow. And give me, give me that thing called love. Wow. So, brave girl, right? So I saw that several of you are struggling with the video here and with the audio. I'm so sorry about that. I don't know how to address it. I don't know how to handle that. Um, I see some comments are being made on chat. I hope that resolves it for you. Ashley Sullivan, how do you think it's going for her? Do you think she's gonna make it or not? Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. Give me a reaction. Sonia says yes, no. So when you look at the faces at the moment, right, we're pretty mixed. Now, some of you might think already, why does he use that example, right? So you might be thinking further, but just based on what we're seeing at the moment, and when you think of, I mean, Steve Tyler's reaction was clear. J-Lo also a pretty clear reaction to that, right? And boy, oh boy, tough situation to be in. Reality is we are sometimes in that situation. We've pitched something and we noticed didn't quite go as we hoped. And either it's because it wasn't a day for us, wasn't the right day, or should have used a different song, right? Maybe it was the wrong pitch for the situation. Maybe something just happened. Here's the thing. Once the pitch is done, once we're done with that, the interesting thing is what happens next. This is a situation where it's clear to her that she is down. She just fell down here, right? She tripped over something, but how is she going to handle that? And she notices it as well. She notices what the reaction of the people were and she can read the room, of course. So let's take a look how this audition continues. I don't know. <laughs> Me composed. Oh, <laughs> uh, bless you. Here's the thing. Can I tell you something? Mm -hmm. You're so adorable. The way you sing and the way you act and the way you're animated is not for American Idol. It is for musical. It is for Broadway. That's where you belong. And everybody has their thing. Everybody I can be more. Not like, oops, I did it again. <laughs> I, can, I can do it. Like, I want to be. I want to be the first. Like show tune pop star. I really think that mainstream needs to get with Liza on Netflix and just like mix it together. And I really, really want to be that Liza Minnelli for her. Oh, please, like I understand what you're saying. Please, 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 please. 
just said that pop needs to get with Liza. Pop needs to get with Liza Minnelli. I know that you're not exactly for me, right, for this? Please let me. But Holly, what? What is going on up here? And it's all good. Oh, that didn't make sense. And I kept going. I like it. I like it. <laughs> I really love her. I really love to go to the playlist. <laughs> All right, well, so it's a no for today, but, um... Give her a golden ticket. <laughs> it's a yes for me. I don't care. Wow. You know what? It's a yes for me, too. Wasn't that phenomenal? Wasn't that absolutely fantastic how she handled that situation? She didn't give up, right? She made her case there. I have no idea what it means. Pop needs to go with Liza Minnelli or the other way around. Can't remember how she said it. But boy, oh boy, when J. Lo says, just give her the golden ticket, that's where she got it. She didn't give up. She hung in there and she did it with grace without being annoying, without being overly pushy, but with grace, she hung in there and tried it again, again, and again. And that's the key, and that's the fifth mindset for the innovator that we really need here. And that is to not give up, but to hang in there and to stick to it. And if we fall down, if we really fall down onto the ground, to get up one more time and to keep trying it. Now, these are the five mindsets of the innovator that I wanted to share with you. They are the five mindsets that I encourage you to put into practice to not pivot, but to really start innovating, to pick up somewhere else, to start something new, to start something powerful, and to become better, to become stronger, and to create something that's truly yours. Now, my challenge for you is this. And this is what I would like you to do as you go through this day and also as you go through the next week and apply everything that you take out of this day. I want you to take the ideas that you pick up in this day. I want you to take them and not just put them aside again like you would in a different conference. Take them and run with it. For the next week, pick something from this conference and make it real. Put it into practice. Step up the way you work. Elevate the way you think at your place of work. Elevate the way you interact with others. Because that one idea that you put into practice, it leads to more ideas. It leads to five more. And that idea leads to another five ideas and more here and more there. And it creates momentum. It creates, it creates energy for you and you get more inertia. And that is super, super important in this competitive, in this fast moving place that we're in. We can't stand still. We cannot rest where we are at the moment. We've got to move forward. And the way to do this is to put one idea into practice again and again and again, so that we get there, so that we truly become innovative and we shift the way in which we organizations, we move the organizations. Go ahead with that, try with that, and I can promise you, you will create something new in your life and in your place of work. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being here and share this message with you. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day that you have ahead of you. Scott, it's over to you again.